Hello, I'm Joseph Abruzzo, your Clerk of the Circuit Court and Comptroller. It is my privilege to introduce our amazing clerks team who will be conducting this webinar designed to help you navigate through the Palm Beach County court system. For years, these seminars were conducted at our courthouse locations. Now we're bringing these sessions online so you can watch live and ask questions. This session is being recorded and will be shared on our website, our YouTube channel, and our social media accounts. You can follow us at Clerk PBC on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We invite you to go back to the recording of this session if there are any points you need to review again. Thank you for watching. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Karina rodriguez Matson. I'm the Director of Civil Court Operations here at um, the Clerk of the Circuit Court and Comptroller in Palm Beach County. And welcome to one of our do-it-yourself in court workshops. Today, we're going to be talking about how to collect a money judgment. Um, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the workshop and everything we'll be covering today. If you have any questions that you need to ask during the presentation, feel free to type them into the chat. At this moment, everyone has been muted. We do have um, very knowledgeable staff that's manning the chat box and can assist you with any questions or direct them my way. And then we'll have a time at the end where we will unmute the participants. If you want to save any questions for the end, you can ask that way as well. Um, so today what we will be covering, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of our office, what our duties are, particularly our self-service functions and how we can assist you with representing yourself in court. I'm gonna give you an introduction to collecting money judgments in general. And then we're going to talk specifically about the mechanisms of judgment liens, um, writs of execution, um, garnishing of wages or bank accounts. And then, as I mentioned, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So the clerk of the circuit court and comptroller um, is the keeper of the court's public records and public funds. And um, part of the functions of the clerk and the comptroller by statute is to assist people um, with procedural information and forms when they're representing themselves in court. So we have a self-service center here at our main courthouse and at our South County Courthouse in Delray. And in all, all of our courthouse locations, we have form packets that are available for purchase. And these form packets have instructions, flow charts, um, as well as the approved Supreme Court or Florida bar forms and local forms that you need to represent yourself in all different kinds of cases. We have over 82 packets, um, anything from divorce to small claims to eviction. Um, at our self-service center, we also have public access computers where you can look up your case via eCase View, which is um, our public case viewing system and research your case. And we even have e-filing station where you could e-file paperwork if you needed um, our assistance. And we also have a navigator program where we have clerk staff that can assist you with filling out the paperwork that you've purchased at our office um, and give you procedural information on how to move your case forward. And I will note, however, that we can only provide ministerial assistance. The clerk's office does not have any attorneys that can represent you and we are not allowed to give legal advice. So now we'll get into the meat of collecting money judgments. And I always start this workshop with a disclaimer um, because I understand how frustrating it can be uh, when you've won your day in court and then you realize that the hard part has just begun. So many people think that if they win a civil judgment in court, the court is gonna assist them with collecting that money that is owed to them, but that is not the case. The court provides you with a judgment, an order that gives you the power to seek enforcement, um, but they um, do not actually monitor the payment of the judgment or assist anyone in finding out how they can collect this money from the defendant. So I'm gonna to talk to you about some mechanisms in which you can do that on your own, but it is very complicated. And 
um, can be very time consuming and costly to um, the holder of the judgment. So I just want to preface that I'm going to try to demystify it and walk you through it um, and answer any questions that you may have about it. But in general, the process is not easy. Um, um, so we're just going to try to do the best we can to get through it and, and assist you to help empower you to be able to collect on your judgment. So under Florida law, you have 20 years to collect on a judgment from the date that it is entered. Um, and during that time, there are two main ways that you can collect on a, a judgment if the debtor doesn't voluntarily um, pay you if you don't enter into some sort of agreement about a regular payment plan um, and they're not paying the judgment. And those two main ways are through uh, a writ of execution, which would allow you to use the sheriff's office to levy any property that the defendant may own and then sell, sell it at a public auction and um, obtain the proceeds towards your judgment from that sale or garnishment which would be either taking the money out of the defendant's pay, it wages if they um, you know, are paid via paycheck or garnishing a bank account or other account where the defendant may have funds. And we're gonna cover both of those options in detail today. And um, we're gonna start with um, levying property. However, regardless of how you choose to try to collect on a money judgment, it's usually a good idea to obtain what's called a judgment lien. And you'd want to obtain this judgment lien if the debtor has any real property or personal property that you intend to either um, attempt to uh, levy or that you would want to be paid out of if that property was ever sold. Um, and a judgment lien is basically like a placeholder. It's your place in line. So a judgment lien is something that you record against the deed if it's real property, or as I will explain later with the, with the state, if it is personal property, so that if anything happens with that property, if that property is sold, um, if that property is levied and sold, if it's sold, if there's a foreclosure sale or anything like that, um, the parties involved in that sale or that transaction will know that you're in line and that this person owes you money and that you should be you know, paid out of any proceeds accordingly um, if there's money left when they get to you. So judgment lien is very important because it saves your spot basically. And um, it can be placed against real property or personal property. So real property, we're talking about real estate, houses, buildings, land, Personal property can include cars, boats, other vehicles, expensive jewelry, et cetera. Um, so as I mentioned, because it saves your spot in line, um, anything that I discuss today, if there's anyone who has filed a judgment lien before you and it's still a valid uh, non-expired judgment lien, then they would have priority uh, over you for any proceeds. Um, with a few exceptions, I'm not going to go into all the details, but I will uh, reference um, the statutes at the end where you can research this more because there are certain kinds of debts that um, the, the people who are owed this money are super creditors and they may have priority. Um, but generally, if you're not a super creditor, anyone who's filed a judgment lien before you would have priority, but you would have priority over anyone who may file a judgment lien against this debtor after you. So how do you file a judgment lien? Well, for personal property, you file um, a judgment lien with the Department of State, and it can actually be submitted online on their website. They have a pre-made form that you can just fill in the blanks and complete. Um, and you can submit it online on their website, which is linked here. Um, or you can print out the form and mail it to the Department of State in Tallahassee. Um, the Department of State charges a $20 fee um, to file a judgment lien against one debtor. If there are additional debtors in your judgment, there's an additional $5 fee for each additional debtor. And judgment liens on personal property are valid for five years. After, um, when you're approaching the five years, you can renew it and extend it for another five years for a total of a 10 year 
a judgment lien against personal property. And this is what the form looks like that you can get on the um, Department of State's website, uh, judgment lien certificate against personal property. Um, if you're trying to file a judgment lien against real property, you have to go to the clerk's office in the county where the person owns the real property. And basically, you're gonna go to the recording, the official records department, and you will record this judgment lien against the personal property owned by the debtor. Um, so it doesn't matter where you got your judgment in Florida to record the judgment lien, you're gonna go to the county where the debtor's real property is located. And basically this judgment lien is gonna be recorded and linked to the deed for the property that you're trying to obtain a judgment lien against. Now I'm gonna give you some specific information about cost for some of these things. And I'm with the disclaimer that they are specific to Palm Beach County. Um, so if you are filing a judgment lien or levying property with a sheriff of another county, you may wanna check with them that they don't have any other additional forms or fees that I did not um, represent in this presentation. But we're gonna use Palm Beach County um, as the example, since uh, most of the participants um, are trying to collect a judgment here in Palm Beach County. So the fee to record a judgment lien against real property is $10 for the first page of your judgment and $8.50 for each additional fee, uh, additional page. Um, and a judgment lien against real property is about a, a little, actually quite a bit longer. It's good for 10 years. And once again, as you're approaching those 10 years, you can renew the filing of the judgment lien against the real property for another 10 years. So that should cover the total 20 years that you have to um, collect this money judgment. Um, in a, you're gonna need a certified copy of your judgment. So if you didn't already get that um, when you left court, you can get that from the clerk of the circuit court and comptroller where your case was, get a certified copy of that judgment. If it's here in Palm Beach County, you can even do that online because we now have our new e-certified program. So you can go to our website, um, use our e-case view, which is our case online case viewer and order a certified copy electronically. But you will need to have a certified copy of your judgment to file a judgment lien against real property. So once you have your judgment lien and you've had your place in line, you're gonna decide, um, you know, what, what you're going to do, how you're going to investigate um, to try to collect this money. And one of the options that I mentioned was that you can obtain what's called a writ of execution to try to seize um, or levy the property of the debtor. So if you know the debtor owns a car or a boat and you'd like to um, have the sheriff auction off basically that car or boat, for example, um, these are the steps that you would do to complete it. Um, the hardest part is that you have to find out if the debtor owns any property and you have to locate that property. So you're gonna locate the property to be seized. The sheriff will not do that for you. You have to find out where the property physically is. And then you're going to come to the clerk's office where you obtained your money judgment and you can request a writ of execution from the department that um, in which your case was filed. Uh, if you're representing yourself here at the Palm Beach County Clerk's Office, we will prepare and issue that writ of execution for you. Um, there is not a fee for the writ of execution. It's included, uh, statutorily included um, with the filing fee that you paid for your case. Um, there are many other fees associated with the sheriff levying and selling that property, but when you request um, the writ of execution, there's not uh, any fees associated with that other than um, if you wanted certified copies of that um, writ, then we do charge the fees for the certification. Okay, property, we'll give you property. Okay. Um, so once you've located the property, you've come with your um, judgment to the clerk's office and requested um, a writ of execution. Um, the clerk is gonna 
issue that writ of execution, and then you're going to need to deliver that to the sheriff in the county where the property is located, along with instructions to the sheriff. And most sheriffs in Florida, if you go to the website, they have um, a pre-made form called instructions for levy that you can fill it out. I'm going to show you what it looks like um, here in Palm Beach County. And um, you're going to fill out the instructions, attach, among other things, a copy of that writ of execution that was issued by the court. And you're going to pay a fee to the clerk, to, excuse me, to the sheriff, um, which is a deposit for all the labor that they're going to put in seizing this property, auctioning it, et cetera. The fee varies and it is quite costly and it depends on the size of the item to be seized. It depends on um, how the how involved it is, sheriff seizing it. Um, so what most sheriff's offices have on their website or available in their offices is um, in a list of different types of property, the weight of the vehicle, the boat, the type of the vehicle, and it'll tell you what the deposit fee is for them to levy and sell the property. Um, and I know for sure that Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office has this schedule of fees for levying on their website. Um, if, you know, we're gonna go through all the steps of the sale, if the sale is successful, then you that deposit will be paid back to you. In addition to the money owed on the judgment, um, the deposit will be paid back to you from the proceeds from the sale. So this is what the instructions for levy um, look like here in um, Palm Beach County. As I mentioned, this is available on the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office website. Um, as I talk, my wonderful team is putting all the links to these websites um, in the chat box. So not only will they be at the end of the presentation, and this presentation is available on the clerk's website, but um, all these chats, the levy fee schedule, the instructions for levy are being put in the chat box as we speak. Okay, this is probably one of the hardest um, parts of the process if you're trying to levy and sell the debtor's property, which is that the sheriff is gonna do a lot of things. They will, pick, they will retrieve the property, they will advertise the sale, they will conduct the sale. However, the sheriff will not research if there are other liens on the property. So if there are other people in line ahead of you who have priority who need to be paid out first and you're required to do so for the sheriff to be able to sell the property. So um, you're gonna have to research and check if there are other liens. How do you do that? Well, just like you recorded, you filed your lien on personal property with the Department of State, and you filed your lien on real property with um, the clerk's office for the county in which the person owns the property, you will have to research with those two entities whether there are any other liens on that property that um, you are trying to seize and levy. And if there are, you have to notify the clerk, I mean, the sheriff. So you will actually have to file a notarized affidavit along with your writ and your instructions for levy, either certifying that you researched in both with both agencies and there weren't any other liens, you're the only one, or there are other liens ahead of me and behind me, and, and these are what I found. For real property, you also have to check with the Florida uh, Uniform on the Florida Unif UCC Uniform Commercial Code website, which we've provided here in the presentation, um, because sometimes people have um, security notes and security interest against someone's property, and those are recorded there with the Florida UCC. So those kinds of liens will also have to be reported to the sheriff's office. In the affidavit that you write to the sheriff's office, you can't just say, yes, there's this lien, and this is the name of the person who holds it. You do need to actually put the address listed on the lien um, for the creditor. So once you've done your research, you've located the property, you research whether anyone else is, um, has any liens or judgments against this property, then um, the sheriff can start the process of attempting to sell the property. It's a public auction. The sheriff is gonna choose the date and the time for the sale. 
The sheriff's going to notify you as well as any other judgment lien holders that you mentioned in your affidavit of the sale. And they're going to advertise the sale for four consecutive weeks. In Palm Beach County, the sheriff takes care of the publication and that's included in that schedule of costs that you're paying, um, that deposit that you're paying with the sheriff's office. However, there are some counties, particularly smaller counties, that require you to arrange the publication once they tell you the date of the sale and then provide them with proof of publication. So you would pay that directly to the newspaper um, that you were advertising in. Fortunately, in Palm Beach County, the sheriff handles publication for you. Um, usually, at least in Palm Beach County, the fee for publication of a legal notice or a notice of sale for four consecutive weeks is $199. Um, as of last, I checked for this presentation. Okay. So the sale date has been chosen. It's been advertised. The public auction will be held. The sheriff will administer that auction. Um, if you'd rather have property instead of the money, um, or at least, you know, the value of that property, because I will explain that sometimes the property is sold and you get money and it's not enough to cover your judgment, especially if there's creditors ahead of you. So you still can continue to try to enforce the rest of the balance of the money owed to you via other methods. Um, but if you, would, if you would prefer, you can actually bid on the property just like any other bidder. Um, but if you don't, the property is going to be sold and the proceeds are gonna be distributed as follows. The sheriff is going to cover any additional cost that they had with the sale. Um, if the costs are covered completely, then you're gonna get your deposit back in full. So that's the, the cost is on that fee schedule that's linked in the chat box. So if that's fully covered, then they're gonna return your deposit to you. Um, you get paid five hundred dollars for your costs and your efforts because remember you had to locate the property, you had to research the liens, get certified copies of all these things, um, get a notarized affidavit. So that five hundred dollars of cost is in addition to the money owed to you um, in the judgment. And then any creditors are going to be paid in the order of filing judgment liens, if any, and. Um, you're the only creditor, then the remaining proceeds minus those costs that were mentioned above will go to you. Um, if there are creditors ahead of you, then you, they will be get paid first and you will only be paid if there are any remaining proceeds out of the sale. So there is the possibility technically, um, so something that you wanna consider when you choose if this is the best option for you, if you're, doing, if you're at the research phase before you've gone to the sheriff um, and you see that this person has a lot of debtors and there's already you know, three other judgment liens ahead of you for high amounts, then this may not be the best method to collect the money judgment because you may go through all these steps and it'll it'll help the creditors ahead of you, but there may not be enough money left over depending on the value of the property to even um, cover any of the money owed to you in the judgment. So something to consider when you're choosing this option is, are you the only creditor that appears to be in line um, or are there other people that, um, are owed money ahead. If the sale of the property produces enough money that you are paid in full, um, then any leftovers should be paid to any creditors that might be in line after you. If there are no other creditors, then that money would be returned to the debtor. Um, I'm told that usually there's not much surplus for these kinds of levies, but if that was the case, it would go to the debtor. Um, something else to consider when you're deciding whether uh, levying and selling property would be the best way to collect on a money judgment is that certain types of property are exempt in Florida under Florida law and cannot be levied and sold by the sheriff. So the debtor's homestead, the house that they live in, um, is, not, uh, is exempt from sale for collection of a debt, primary residence of the debtor. Um, and then individual debtors can choose to exempt one vehicle worth up to $1,000 or $1,000 or less, or one item of personal property worth 1,000 items or less. That only applies to individual. If the defendant that owes you money is a corporation or a business, they cannot claim those exemptions. Um, this last bullet point is the one that I hear time and time again from individuals that is very frustrating to them. 
um, but it is um, what the law currently is. If the individual, you find out that they own property, um, but they own it jointly with someone else. So there's two or three owners. It cannot be levied unless you have a judgment against all of the owners of the property. So if they own something with their, their spouse, and you don't have a judgment against them and their spouse, you just have a judgment against them, then that property cannot be levied by the sheriff. So that's a basic overview of the levying process um, and um, how you can collect a money judgment through a writ of execution. We're gonna talk about garnishments now. Um, as far as steps go, this process is definitely easier, uh, requires less research on your part, um, and it is also much less costly. However, you know, it does require you to know where the debtor works if they are paid, you know, above the table with um, wages or a paycheck, and um, it or requires you to know where the debtor may have a bank account. You don't always have that information, and sometimes that information is a little harder to locate than whether someone owns a car or a home, which you can research through um, public records. But a writ of garnishment is another enforcement option available to collect a money judgment. If you know where the debtor works or if, the, if you know where they have a money account, you may be able to garnish their wages or bank accounts to um, pay the money owed to you in the judgment. And I do, once again, reiterate, you may want to consult with an attorney before deciding what option is best for you um, from the options that I'm going over with you today. So there are a lot of limits on garnishment, just like they are for levying property. Um, if you're garnishing someone's wages, you, could, you cannot garnish more than 25% of their weekly disposable income. If their income exceeds 30 times the federal minimum wage, and don't worry, in the next slide, I'm gonna do that math for you. Um, if their weekly income is less than 30 times the federal minimum wage, then their income cannot be garnished at all. So what does that look like? Currently, the federal minimum wage is still $7.25 an hour. I know some states have changed that, but this is based on federal minimum wage. So um, you multiply that times 30, that's $217.50. So if the debtor's take-home pay is less than $217.50 a week, I've also given you the monthly or the annual amount there. That's easier for you to envision then you cannot garnish their wages. If it's more than that amount, then you can garnish their wages up to 25% of their take-home pay. But, there's a big but. Um, just like there's certain property that can be exempted from levy, um, there is a head of household exemption from garnishment. So garnishing someone's wages, they can, when you notify them, uh, file a claim of exemption as a head of household. A head of a family is defined um, by statute as a person providing more than half of the support for a child or another dependent. So if the debtor is a head of family, they are exempt from garnishment. Even a head of family who earns more than $750 uh, dollars a week is still pretty much exempt from garnishment because what the law says is they are only subject to garnishment if they agree to it in writing. So, you know, sometimes, especially if you go to small claims court and there's mediation provided by the court, there's a pretrial conference, if you reach an agreement, you know, it may be part of the agreement that the person agrees to garnishment. But if they are eligible and claim a head of household ex exemption and they don't agree to it in writing, then you would not be able to garnish this um, individual's wages. So how do you obtain a rate of garnishment? Well, there's a few steps. And um, the first thing you're gonna do is come to the clerk's office or you know, electronically file with the clerk's office, um, either a motion for a writ of garnishment or a continuing writ of garnishment in the same case where you obtained this money judgment. A writ of garnishment is when you're requesting to garnish a bank account or any other type of account. And this is a one-time garnishment. 
So this person has this bank account and there's $8,000 in that bank account and they owe me $4,500 from my judgment. I want to garnish it from this bank account. When you file a motion for a writ of continuing, uh, continuing writ of garnishment, it is for garnishment from wages. So this is um, a garnishment that's going to occur continuously every time the person gets paid until the judgment is paid in full. At our self-service centers and online on our website, um, you can purchase a template. We have a motion for writ of garnishment or continuing writ of garnishment packet that you could use if you wanted to draft your own and you didn't know where to begin. Um, and it comes with these instructions as well as pre-made template motion. Um, you're gonna file that with the clerk's office. The filing fee is $85. Um, that is the same for all the whole state of Florida. That's a statutory fee. Um, but that's really the only fee that is associated with requesting um, a writ of garnishment from our office. So that's why I was saying that the cost up front are um, much lower than with the levying process. Now, a writ of garnishment is issued by, can be issued by the clerk. Um, so it is much more immediate process, but a continuing writ of garnishment actually has to be reviewed and ordered by a judge. So that motion will be sent up to the judge. So there may be a waiting period um, depending on what else the judge is dealing with at that time. But um, when you file this with the clerk's office, we can provide you some information about that. Um, so what I want to know, and it's very important is, and like I said, you can purchase a template from us, but when you fill in the blanks, the proposed writ must mirror the judgment. So if the judgment that you got said that you were entitled to $7,800 plus 4.2% in interest, um, then that's all you can ask for in the judgment. You can't say, well, since then, I had this other problem and I think they owe me another $200 because of this inconvenience. Or, you know, I tried the levying thing and it didn't work out and I incurred all these fees. So I want to put all of this in my writ of garnishment. Well, you don't have a judgment for those other expenses. Um, and so that cannot be included in this writ of garnishment. It has to mirror the judgment. Whatever you were awarded in the judgment is what you can ask for in the writ. If the writ doesn't mirror the judgment, then the judge is not going to sign that. Um, grant that writ. Um, so the clerk will issue the writ to you if it's granted, and then you must arrange service on the garnishee. The garnishee is not the debtor. The garnishee is the person who is gonna be garnishing the money. So that's either the employer or the bank representative, um, and they need to be served with this writ by a sheriff or a private process server. So that is another fee that is associated with the writ is the service. Um, the sheriff um, will charge uh, the fee for service, but the sheriff is $40. Private process servers are private businesses, so they vary. So if you decide to hire a private process server, you will have to in inquire with them as to what their fee is. Um, it has to be a certified um, private process server. So the 15th Judicial Circuit um, and their website is 15, the number 15thcircuit.com. Um, they have a list of all the certified process servers here in Palm Beach County that are approved. So if you wanted that, you could access that on their website. Um, I, I couldn't help but see a comment in the chat. Yes, the motion for the writ is packet number 72 um, under other packets if you're trying to purchase it online. That is correct. Um, so once the garnishee has been served, there's a 20 day waiting period where the garnishee, not the debtor, can file an answer. So what would that answer be? Maybe you served an employer and the employer says this person quit, they no longer work here. Um, so there is this 20 day waiting period to make sure that the garnishee doesn't have any kinds of objection to taking um, this money. Um, if they file an answer, they don't always file an answer if they don't have a problem with garnishing. Um, the wages or the bank account. If, if they file an answer, you disagree with the answer, then you have a 20 day period in which you can file a reply before um, moving this forward. And um, if there's a disagreement, you can file a reply and you can request a hearing for the judge and the judge will settle that. Um, 
Um, once that time period has passed where the garnishee has the right to answer, then you have you, there's also a period of time when the debtor has the opportunity um, to answer. So when the writ is issued by the clerk, they're also going to give you a form that's called a notice to the defendant of the right against garnishment of wages, money, and other property. It's going to be attached to it. And when you serve the debtor, um, you have to include that document with the copy of the writ. Now, unlike the garnishee, which has to, who has to be personally served, the debtor can actually be served the writ of garnishment by mail. Um, so it can be mailed and a, and a certificate of service can be filed indicating with the clerk's office, indicating that the debtor has been served. Um, you're required to give them that notice, which explains to them the right to be exempt as a head of household and the amount of money that can be garnished um, from their wages and their rights um, regarding asking the judge to dissolve the writ. So I'm going to show you what that notice looks like shortly. Um, as I mentioned, the, um, you have the even though the garnishing has to be filed, I mean served in person, the debtor can be served by mail. And if during that 20 day waiting period, you got an answer from the garnishee, then you have to include that in the packet that you're having the debtor served with as well. So in a case where the garnishee had an answer, you would serve them with the writ, the notice of their rights and the garnishee's answer um, only if that part's applicable. Um, you, if, if, the, if you're, the garnishing hasn't filed an answer, you have to wait that full 20 days to make sure they don't, and then you can serve the debtor. But let's say the garnishing files an answer 10 days into that um, waiting period, then you can go ahead and serve the debtor and you actually have to serve them within five days of receiving that answer. If not, you're gonna wait the 20 days and then you're gonna serve the debtor. And this is what the notice um, to the defendant that you have to include looks like just in case you misplace or lose the one that is attached to your writ, you can obtain this form on our website online um, and print out another one if you need it. So 20 days is the magic number. Once you've served the debtor, then there's another 20 day waiting for you to see if the debtor has is gonna file a claim of exemption or any kind of answer. Um, they have to serve it on you, just like you serve them with the writ. Um, they are also allowed to serve it to you by mail. It doesn't have to be personally served. Um, if you're served with an objection, a claim of exemption, an answer by the debtor, you have eight business days if you were served in person or 14 business days if you were served by mail to file an objection to their claim and set the matter for hearing. And I'd just like to uh, clarify that even though the claim of exemption filed by the debtor says claim of exemption and request for a hearing, you, the person who has the writ, has to be the one that actually sets a hearing. Um, because if the debtor files a claim of exemption and you do not object to it, you do not file an objection and set it for hearing, then the court can just automatically dissolve that writ, assuming that you read the claim of exemption and are not contesting it. You're going to be the one that would have to set it for hearing if you're objecting to the claim of the exemption filed by the debtor. You don't really believe that they're the head of household or that they qualify for this exemption. Okay. So at this point, it can go, your motion could go one of two ways. If the garnishee doesn't file an answer within 20 days of service or files an answer that doesn't contest the garnishment for some reason, um, and, and um, the debtor does not file a claim of exemption, then you can come to the clerk and request your final judgment of garnishment, which is going to be an order that um, orders the garnishee to garnish the debtor's wages of the account. Um, but if the garnishee filed an answer and you filed a reply, or the debtor filed a claim of exemption and you're filing an objection, you're going to have to request a hearing, and the judge is going to decide if the judge grants um, the rate of garnishment at the final hearing, then you walk out with that final judgment of garnishment. Um, a couple of things. The garnishee can file an answer. The garnishee, remember, is the person who's taking the money out 
from the debtor's bank account or wages, they can, by statute, request up to $100 in costs for having to conduct this garnishment. Um, they would have to request it. It's not an automatic thing. Um, if they did, you may be able to recover the cost. Um, it's, you didn't, you, you, it's not in your writ because, number one, you don't know whether the, the garnish is going to ask for it or not. And number two, that $100 wasn't in your judgment. But um, what, if the garnishee files an answer, the court can, in their order, in their final judgment of garnishment, say that um, in addition to collecting the money owed to you in the judgment, you can collect an, an additional $100 to cover the $100 that the garnishee asked that you provide up front. Sometimes the court will actually also include the $85 uh, filing fee that you paid for the writ of garnishment in your final judgment of garnishment so that you can be reimbursed that money as well. Um, in your, you can request these things in your motion. In your motion, you can say that I want the writ that mirrors the judgment plus and, you know, any cost or filing fees incurred with the filing of this motion for the writ of garnishment so that the judge knows that you like that to be included in the final judgment. So that is how you go about collecting a, um, obtaining a writ of garnishment for either a continuing garnishment of someone's wages or um, someone's bank account. I'm gonna look and see if there's any questions that we didn't cover. It looks like I have one that was um, sent to me directly. So I'll take a look at it. And then um, these links that I have here, they, um, um, our communication staff has been including them in the chat in the appropriate slide throughout the presentation. So they're all located in our chat. And as I mentioned, this whole presentation is actually, this PowerPoint is on the self-service page of our website. So you can actually obtain these links from there as well. So I'm just giving you the links to the SunBiz um, website for the Department of State for information on judgment liens and collecting a money judgment in general. That website is also where you would um, get the judgment lien form for personal property. Um, and they have a fillable PDF form, which I've also linked there. Um, we have the website for the sheriff's office where you can get the instructions for levy um, for here in Palm Beach County. So now that I've walked you through the very complicated process of trying to collect on a money judgment, I'm gonna open it up for any questions um, Caitlin, if you can help me with anyone who might have a question and needs to be unmuted, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen now and we'll open it up for any questions. Yeah, if you have a question, you can go ahead and use the um, raise hand function and I will unmute you or you can type it in the chat. All right, Karina, it doesn't look like I see any um, raised hands. Well, I would like to point something out. We, there, there's an attorney um, who is part of our audience, and they did make a very good point um, that the garnishment, when I mentioned that you can garnish up to 25% um, percent of someone's net income after all deductions, that it's technically not all deductions, those just required by law. So he mentioned that, if someone has deductions for like a 401k, health insurance, a savings club, um, those would not be included or deducted from gross when calculating the net for purposes of 25%. Um, and something else to clarify, and thank you so much, um, uh, Mr. Lampert. Um, when I say that the, that the writ has to mirror the judgment, what I mean is that uh, most of the time you cannot ask for more than um, what the judgment is requesting. But um, as you mentioned, maybe somebody has already paid, you received a partial payment towards the judgment and you're not owed the full amount. You, you can't ask for less. Um, so it's not gonna always be exact. I, what I was trying to convey was that um, you can't ask for something additional that you believe that you're owed that wasn't that you don't have a judgment for. So 
So thank you so much, um, Mr. Lambert, for uh, th those clarifications. Does anybody else have? Yes, it looks like Mary has a question. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute. Hi, um, I came in late, um, but I just wanted to ask, cause I work for victim services yes. and a lot of times we get victims that come into office and ask us, um, how is it that they are supposed to receive the restitution that came on their case? So I never know where to send them. I just tell them to go downstairs to the clerk's office. Mm -hmm. So what would be um, best for me to explain to them on where should they go to get more information on that? Well, that's a great, that is a great question. Mm -hmm. um, and the clerk's office can assist them with that to a certain extent. So this presentation was definitely for civil money judgments like obtained mm -hmm. in small claims, county civil or circuit civil court. Mm -hmm. But there is a process by which you could you can take a restitution order from a criminal case mm -hmm. and um, file it, a case for enforcement in civil court. Mm -hmm. so you would send them to the circuit civil department and we can give them some more information on that. Um, so they can um, open a civil case okay. you know, to convert it into a judgment. Uh, I don't know all the details right now. I wasn't prepared to cover that, but there That's is okay. a process. But there is a process by which they can get with their restitution order, you know, a writ or other enforcement. It just requires um, us to create a, a civil enforcement action. Right. And I actually believe and that department in the main courthouse, that's where I'm housed at. Correct. Where's that's that on the located? third floor. Third floor. OK. 3.23 okay. is the circuit civil department. OK. Um, and I, and I don't want to misspeak, so I'm just giving my general understanding of the process. And I actually believe there's a statute where um, they they don't have to pay like a new case filing fee for that. OK, um, I just to wanted to know because I never know where to send them. I'm like, I don't know. So I just want to at least I know if they go to that department, they could give them a better explanation. Yes, we can assist them with that. OK, thank you, Karina. All right. Anyone and else? I, I don't see any other hands raised or anything else in the chat. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, if you think of a question later, um, if you're on our self-service um, page of our website, in addition to being able to look over this presentation and all the links, we have toolboxes for different areas where you can read up more information. And then we have a self-service email box and you can always send us an email if you think of a question later and um, we'll be happy to address it then. Thank you so much everyone for coming. Have a great afternoon. Um, we're gonna have another workshop. We're, we're gonna be doing these monthly. So be on the lookout for more information on our website and social media for April. Um, we're going to be doing the how to file for divorce workshop. And so um, that one's usually very popular and we hope to see you there. Thank you so much.